All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Today in Vienna, the Secretary General joined former Governor of California and R20 President Arnold Schwarzenegger at the formal opening of the annual R20 conference, which brings together leaders at the subnational level, the private sector and civil society, to support governments in developing and financing low-carbon and climate-resilient infrastructure projects in the fields of renewable energy, energy-efficient lighting, and waste optimization. In his remarks, the Secretary General underscored the importance of the work done below the national level, saying that climate action at the subnational level is key to addressing the climate crisis. The Secretary General said that we need a post-carbon economy, a climate-smart development pathway that can provide inclusive prosperity for all on a healthy planet. This is doable, he added, provided that there is political will. The Secretary General pointed to the absurdity of the ongoing subsidies of fossil fuel. What we are doing, he said, is that we are using taxpayers' money to boost hurricanes, to spread droughts, to melt glaciers, to bleach corals, in other words, to, the, to destroy the world. On the sidelines of the conference, the Secretary General met with Dr. Gunther Thalinger from the German insurance group Alliance, whom he thanked for supporting the UN's climate finance efforts. Prior to leaving Austria, the Secretary General sat down and interviewed Mr. Schwarzenegger for his Instagram account. The Secretary General is now on his way to Aachen, Germany, to take part in the ceremonies around the awarding of the Charlemagne Prize. Uh, and you will have seen that we shared the Secretary General's remarks yesterday at the 40th anniversary celebrations of the Vienna International Center, which is home to a number of UN agencies. The Secretary General also met with Austrian President Alexander van der Bellen and spoke to the media afterwards, and those press remarks are out as well. The Security Council this morning received a briefing on Syria from Ursula Muller, the Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs, who told council members that an estimated 3 million people in Idlib are caught up in the crossfire of recent fighting. She said that despite the announcement of a temporary ceasefire on the 17th of May, fighting in Idlib has continued and she described repeated attacks in recent weeks on health facilities in northwestern Syria. Ms. Muller said that so far in May, more than 170,000 ready-to-eat meals have been handed out to those who fled the latest violence, with shelter being provided for 25,000 newly displaced people. She warned that further military operations will overwhelm our ability to respond. She asserted that all parties are obliged to abide by international humanitarian law, and sparing hospitals and schools is a legal obligation, not an option. Ms. Muller also drew attention to the situation around Rukban, saying that the United Nations now has access to the more than 13,000 people who have left Rukban and is providing humanitarian assistance to them. But access is still needed for the population inside Rukban, and a third humanitarian convoy is needed to go to the area. The Under Secretary General for Peace Operations, Jean Pierre Lacroix, and the Under Secretary General for the Department of Operational Support, Atul Khare, are in Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan, to attend the Fifth International Partnership for Technology in Peacekeeping Symposium. They will both speak at the opening of the four-day meeting, whose theme is Predict, Prevent, Protect. The conference, hosted by the UN Department of Operational Support in cooperation with the Kazakh government, brings together representatives from governments, international organizations, and non-governmental organizations to discuss peacekeeping issues. Mr. Lacroix and Mr. Kare will also hold meetings with Kazakh officials and will also meet a contingent from Kazakhstan that has just returned for them from their deployment with the UN Interim Force in Lebanon. A new UN Human Rights Report has found that people in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea are trapped in a vicious cycle of deprivation, corruption, uh, de uh, deprivation and corruption. The report is based on more than 200 first-hand accounts by escapees. It says that the country's public distribution system has been broken for two decades, forcing people to try to eke out a living in a legally precarious parallel economy, putting them at risk of arbitrary arrest, detention, and extortion. The High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, said that the rights to food, health, shelter, work, freedom of movement, and liberty are universal and inalienable. But in the DPRK, they depend primarily on the ability of individuals to bribe state officials. She stressed the need to tackle what she called the country's profound human rights problem. Only then, Ms. Bachelet said, can the endemic system of corruption which pervades all aspects of life be effectively dismantled. The full report is online. Our humanitarian colleagues say that more than 82,000 people have fled their homes due to conflict and deteriorating conditions in affected areas in and around the Libyan capital, Tripoli. 
We estimate that over 100,000 people remain in immediate frontline areas with over 400,000 more in areas directly impacted by clashes within one kilometer of the front where conditions are deteriorating. Some 146 civilian casualties, including 40 deaths, have been verified. Water shortages and electricity cuts are increasingly hitting conflict-affected neighborhoods. A 37% reduction in water supply to Tripoli from the man-made river project network remains of concern as temperatures rise. The UN Refugee Agency today said that a recent strike in, a spike in clashes in northwestern Nigeria has forced some 20,000 people to flee neighboring Niger to ne neighboring Niger since April. UNHCR is working closely with authorities in Niger to provide basic assistance and register these people. The latest surge in violence is not linked to Boko Haram, but rather to clashes between different ethnic groups, with those fleeing reporting extreme violence, such as machete attacks and sexual violence. UNHCR says that Niger continues to be a leading example in the region for providing safety to refugees who have fled conflict and persecution. It has kept its borders open despite fighting in several regions bordering Nigeria, Mali, and Burkina Faso. Our colleagues at UNICEF said today that the number of attacks on schools in Afghanistan tripled from 68 to 192 between the years 2017 and 2018. This marks the first time the numbers increased since 2015. UNICEF Executive Director Henrietta Four said that the senseless attacks on schools, the killing, injury, and abduction of teachers, and threats against education are destroying the hopes and dreams of an entire generation of children. Due to the conflict in Afghanistan, more than 1,000 schools closed by the end of last year, leaving half a million children out of school. Also on education, the Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mark Lowcock, took part in the third international conference on safe schools in Palma de Mallorca, Spain yesterday. He said that in the last five years, there have been more than 14,000 attacks on schools in 34 countries. In Yemen, Mr. Lokok said some 2,000 schools are inoperable, while in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, children who are not in school face a higher risk of being recruited by armed groups, being kidnapped, being enslaved, and facing child marriage. His full remarks are online. Our human rights colleagues in Geneva today condemned the rise in anti-Semitic incidents taking place in Europe and in the United States. Such events, the UN Human Rights Office said, unfortunately are not isolated, with acts of physical violence against Jews having increased in a number of countries, especially Germany, France, and the United States in recent years. The office urges all governments to redouble their efforts to combat racism and related intolerance in all its forms. Uh, on Friday, too late for our briefing, we made a senior personnel announcement. The Secretary General appointed Lieutenant General Shailesh Tanakar of India as his new force commander of the UN mission in South Sudan, or UNMIS for short. And today, we say a big thank you to Andorra and Guinea for their payments to the regular budget. The total number of member states who have contributed is now 100. And uh, in a short while, uh, I'll be joined by Luis Alfonso de Alba, the Secretary General's Special Envoy for the 2019 Climate Summit. And of course, we will also have with us Monica Villela Greli, the spokesperson for the President of the General Assembly. Before uh, we get to those parts, are there any questions for me? Yes, Sylviane. Uh, thank you, Farhan. Uh, the uh, maritime border between Israel and uh, Lebanon, uh, they are the delineating of the delineation of the border is in the final stage, according to the foreign minister of Lebanon. How much uh, the UN is involved in that matter? Are we heading to a more peaceful agreement or peace treaty between Lebanon? and Israel? Uh, as you know, uh, borders between states, including maritime borders, are agreed to by states themselves. The UN doesn't determine them. Uh, as you know, we've tried to play a helpful role in the region, including through the work of the Maritime Task Force. Uh, but of course, we would welcome any progress uh, by the respective countries towards delineate, delineating their borders. Uh, yes, please. Good afternoon. I'd like to go to West Africa regarding the continued violence in West Africa. Over the weekend, there were four people killed at a Catholic church Sunday in Burkina Faso. And the um, prosecutor of the ICC, Fatou Ben Souda, said they, these were may be falling in the jurisdiction of war crimes. And the UNSG also stated that these may be war crimes, these terror attacks against um, innocent civilians. So the question is, has the UNSC 
UNSG making the overtures to Fatou Bansouda to get the ball rolling on prosecuting those responsible for these heinous crimes? Uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations has no role uh, in referring prosecutions to the International Criminal Court, uh, which is an independent body. Basically, the Independent Criminal Court, uh, the prosecutor, Ms. Bensouda, uh, can deal with cases uh, having to do with countries that uh, are under the Rome Statute of the Court, or she can have cases referred to by the members of the Security Council. But those are the ways uh, uh, those situations come to her. But uh, uh, the Secretary General has made his views known on the importance of avoiding attacks on religious sites, including in Burkina Faso. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, would you have a comment on the situation in Kosovo, and uh, is there concern about the police operation uh, in the north of Kosovo and uh, Serbian troops moving apparently towards uh, uh, Kosovo? Well, our, our mission in Kosovo, UNMIC, has, has actually commented on this. Uh, the UN mission in Kosovo said that it's concerned by developments in northern Kosovo today, uh, including the detention of two UN staff members who were carrying out their duties by the Kosovo police. Uh, both staff members were subsequently transferred to a hospital for the treatment of their injuries. One of those staff members has been released, uh, and the mission is establishing the price, precise circumstances in close coordination with all international agencies on the ground. Uh, our special representative there, Zahir Tanen, has called for the UN staff member to be released immediately. Yes, please. Yes, no, follow up on that. Uh, do you have any updates on the condition of Russian uh, national who was detained there? Uh, we are, uh, the, the Russian staff member has been released and, and is being uh, looked at right now. Uh, beyond that, uh, what I can say is that uh, Mr. Tanen, the special representative, made clear that if any harm were done to the staff members, that that, that would have its own diplomatic repercussions. But, uh, there was, sorry, there was information that he is in hospital right now. Can you confirm that? Uh, all all I can say at this stage is that he's he's being examined uh, following his release. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you, yes, thanks. I have a question about Colombia. There are hundreds of human rights defenders and community leaders being killed and thousands are faced with death threats by armed groups, especially in rural regions. How does the UN react to this? Uh, our, uh, our human rights office has uh, raised concerns about uh, the different uh, attacks that have taken place in such regions in Colombia. Uh, and, uh, and we uh, continue to follow up on those. Uh, obviously, we want uh, all of the parties in, in Colombia to abide by the agreements uh, th that have uh, brought down the level of violence in the country, and, and we're certainly hoping that it will continue to uh, uh, decrease. Yes, please. Just a quick follow-up to Kosovo. Do we know uh, the nationality of the second uh, person uh, from the UN being detained there? Uh, it, this is, that is a national staff member. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a Kosovar staff member. Okay. Thank you. And if that's it, uh, hold on. I believe uh, we'll check whether the guest is ready. Otherwise, if not, we, we can go first with, uh, with Monica. Hold on one second. <laughs> 